have a very special panel today. It's something that's a little off the beaten track from what we normally do at ULI, which is to celebrate technology in, in our business to give us some insight on where things are going. Uh, this concept of back to the future is uh, straight out of Hollywood. In the movie Back to the Future, Biff gets his hands on the future historical uh, sporting scores and then proceeds to dominate the world by making a pile of money by cheating because he had the crystal ball to predict what was going to happen. And we are at a point in time in our industry where there are a lot of people who have a lot of brain power developing crystal balls with big data, with websites, with all the information that we are giving them for free through our transactions, through our mo mobile uh, applications, through our GPS. And how do we harness that? How do we profit from this so that we don't get run over by companies who end up wanting to do what we're doing? Whether you're a broker, where we're probably, frankly, the first to become extinct, or a developer, where your competition is out gunning you because they have their tools and they're maximizing them. So we very much want your input, your questions, all throughout this presentation. No holds barred. Everything's fair game. And because this is being recorded, if you could just do us the favor of stepping up to the microphone throughout the process or raising your hand and we'll bring a microphone over uh, to make sure that your questions are repeated. And if that's too cumbersome because you're in the middle of the aisle, shout out your question. I will repeat the question or restate the question with, through my microphone to make sure it is uh, recorded for posterity. Ground rules sound good? Yeah. All right, great. So let me introduce our speakers. To my right, we have Krishna Rao, who is the economist at Zillow where he gets paid to play with real estate data all day. Originally from Shoreham, New York, Krishna has worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, developing forecasting models. Uh, and after they failed to predict the recent financial crisis, hmm. he decided he probably <laughs> should study can. some more. <laughs> and he went to graduate school at Stanford for his PhD where he worked diligently on improving these models before being drawn to Zillow by an opportunity to develop tools to help consumers make decisions around housing. He works on forecasting home prices, analyzing real estate market conditions, and just recently took the plunge and bought a house in Seattle. And we'll hear a little bit more about his personal journey. <laughs> to his right, we have Matt Lerner, who is one of the co-founders of WalkScore. He actually biked here from Seattle. True story. With a train in between. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and uh, Matt grew up in unwalkable Topeka, Kansas, which is why he's so passionate about walkable neighborhoods. Matt is a software person who has become deeply interested in urban planning because he believes walkable neighborhoods are one of the simplest and most enjoyable solutions to some of our toughest problems. Before WalkScore, Matt was the lead program manager responsible for Microsoft Windows user interface. I think you were like the start menu guy, right? Yeah, but don't blame me for any Windows <laughs> complaints. <laughs> it's, it's a big you know, start menu. Everyone touches it every time they go to Windows. So that's a pretty big deal, right? Uh, I thought so. And prior to that, Matt founded a software startup that he sold to Microsoft. He lives in Seattle and rides his bike up a big hill every day to work, which makes him a pretty fit guy. And to his right, um, just funny story, some of you may have been hoping to see Chris Leinberger. I know I've heard a lot of complaints that you don't know who the speakers are or who the descriptions are. Chris, unfortunately, uh, could not join us. Uh, and, and we were very, very fortunate to find an incredible, uh, uh, not even a replacement, someone to just take the conversation to the next level with Kate Knight. Kate and I bumped, this is classic ULI story, right? We bumped into each other. Uh, we hadn't seen each other for a year since New York, and we bumped into each other at a urban development mixed use uh, cocktail hour last night. Tell, tell them where the, where the cocktail hour was. At the Vancouver Aquarium. 
And what was happening in the background? You tell it. Beluga whales, <laughs> amazing. It, <laughs> Cheers we, to the programming committee. We, we crossed paths at the Beluga whale show, right? And uh, I was explaining this program, and she said, oh, I'm at Redfin. So what's unique about Kate's perspective is Kate used to be one of us. She used to be an institutional investor with AIG. She's handled billions of dollars of workouts, and she's eminently qualified in that institutional space with an undergraduate degree in Dartmouth and uh, uh, MBA, no less, from Columbia. I forgot to mention, by the way, Matt, this is an all Ivy panel here, by the way. <laughs> Matt is a Brown guy, and I'm a Cornell guy, so you know, we, we, we have a pretty good represent, representation. And uh, so Kate is now starting something very exciting at Redfin, and I will let her describe that when she goes through it, but she really brings that real estate expert's perspective who's now in technology. We have a true technologist, we have an economist, and then I'm just here to get out of the way. So with that, let's go right into it, and we'll present each speaker. We'll have a chance to offer some slides on what they're doing, what their platform looks like. But why don't we give you guys some feedback from the crowd? How many Sounds people good. here have logged into Zillow? The ads are working. I like it. All right, great. How many people have logged into WalkScore? How many have logged into Redfin? I think it's like the same hand. So the folks who haven't been raising their hands, you're in the right room. You know about the internet, right? So let's do that. <laughs> easy now, easy now. We outnumber you. That's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I thought I'd spend a little bit of time for those of you who aren't as familiar with Zillow, talking a little bit about uh, our business, sort of how it started, the ideas behind it, and then talk a little bit about sort of data, what we're doing with data, and where we see sort of this space around data and prediction going in the future. Uh, Zillow was inspired by the way home shopping used to work in the not so distant past, sort of 10 years ago. If you wanted to buy a home, you had to go call an agent, you'd describe to the agent what you were looking for, your agent would show you a place, you'd give your agent some feedback, they'd show you another place. And it sort of felt like looking around in a dark room where your agent had the only flashlight. And what you really want to do is grab the flashlight for yourself, or even better, just turn on the lights. And that was the idea, the idea behind Zillow, to try to give the consumer access to the whole universe of properties that are for sale by an agent, by an owner, in a foreclosure auction, new construction, right? To try to really empower the consumer to find for themselves what they wanted. That was great timing on turning on the lights. Yeah, you know, this is, these are good slides, I guess. Uh, the second part of Zillow's sort of equation was to use technology and the massive amount of data around real estate to really demystify the home shopping process. I think for a lot of people, buying a home is one of the most important financial decisions they make, and they're confused throughout the entire process. Right? Zillow was really trying to use data to sort of draw back the curtain a little bit and make it a little clearer to people how the housing market worked. And when we first launched, one of the big ways to try to do that was what we call the Zestimate, an estimate of the value of every home in the US. So that's what you're seeing here in these slides. Zillow launched with the Zestimate, but since then, we've really broadened out the way we use data to analyze the housing market. We have this whole host of tools we use to sort of think about what trends are we seeing. I've listed some of the examples here. It would definitely take me more time than we have to go through all of them, but at Zillow, we're looking at you know, the, the Zillow Home Value Indexes. These are indexes of home prices at very local levels that allow you to see how prices are moving. We produce forecasts for where we think home prices are going, all the way from the nation as a whole down to the individual house. So you can look at your house and see where Zillow thinks in a year roughly what it's going to be worth. We do lots of analysis around issues like affordability. You know, where, are the, where are the neighborhoods and how have prices been moving relative to incomes? Or, are people sort of struggling to make mortgage payments in certain areas at a very local neighborhood level. Uh, I put up an example of, of the sort of analysis we do. This is an analysis we did recently looking at negative equity. So here we looked at um, homeowners that had a mortgage and tried to figure out how many people are underwater and where are they located. So this is a, a picture of New York. The darker red areas are areas where a large fraction of homeowners with a mortgage are underwater. And the lighter areas are areas where that fraction is a little bit lower. 
And when this is, I mean, just an example, we produce these sort of reports on a, an almost daily basis, but we really think they help people from all across the spectrum understand what's going on in the market. If you're a homeowner, you can know a little bit more about your local neighborhood. If you're a lender, you have a better idea about where foreclosures are happening and where they might be happening in the future. If you're a builder, you know a little bit more about how this might tie into inventory or things like that. Right? So we really do produce a whole host of analysis looking at these sort of issues. And in general, when, we're, when we think about the sort of questions we want to tackle, we think about them on sort of two different dimensions. The first is the sophistication. At the bare minimum, what we try to do at Zillow is take all the data that's available and sort of gather and collect it into a way that sort of is actionable information for people out there. Right? Data is often messy. We try to sort of clean it up and organize it. Right? So when I was talking previously about this idea of the Zestimate and us estimating home prices, the first step in that process was to go through all the county records and collect a centralized database of for every property. What are the characteristics? How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms does it have? When did it last sell? When was it listed? How much was it listed for? And sort of provide that to a consumer in an easily approachable format. For, so anyone can have that sort of information. The next step we want to do is then use all that data to provide real insight by combining it with some analytics, which is sort of where my job comes in. And that's where we take all that data and we add some sort of algorithmic wizardry and end up with an estimate of the value of every home. And where we think this is really effective is where we can do it on this second dimension at a really hyper-local level. Right? Often a lot of these analyses we can do at the individual home level. So you, anyone that's interested in analyzing what's going on doesn't have to see a picture of what's going on at the national level or at the state level, or even the county level. You can look at individual zip codes or individual neighborhoods, however you want to define them. Right? So ideally, we try to combine analysis that we think is both sophisticated and we can do at scale in this really hyper-local way. It's not always possible. Uh, we do a lot of interesting work on affordability where we look at, as I mentioned earlier, have price increases really outpaced income changes. Th that sort of data, I think, is really valuable. It's a really valuable analysis we do. But we can't get really granular data on income. It's just not possible. So there, we'll do, we'll do analysis that's sophisticated, but doesn't have that same sort of scale. On sort of the opposite side, sometimes we'll do analysis that are at very local scales, looking at how sale prices are changing. But we can't do them particularly in a particularly sophisticated fashion. If you look at just sale prices, you never know if the changes you're seeing are due to a change in what's selling or a change in actual fundamental forces. We spend a lot of time analyzing and looking at data. And as soon as we do that, we turn around and we give it away for free. So if you go to Zillow.com slash research, any of the analysis that we do, you can find there. You can find the underlying data. You can play with it however you want. We try to make it as accessible as possible. Because fundamentally, we think that data sort of wants to be free. If we don't give it to you guys, someone else will. So we want to be the first to give you guys this most accurate picture of the housing market as possible. Right? We do this because fundamentally, Zillow's a technology company. It's also a media company. We want to drive traffic to our website. And I think our, our strategy so far has been very successful. So this, this chart's actually a little bit out of date. We just released our figures for February. And in the month of February alone, 77 million unique users came to Zillow.com to look for information on the housing market. Right? And we think achieving this sort of scale is really setting us up for sort of the 2.0 version of what we want to try to do. And so that's- let's, let's clarify that for a second. Sure. <clears throat> you're a media company, which means you're making money. Yeah, so the business model is not to, we don't try to make money off this data. We try to use the data to drive traffic and then we sell ads, right? So if, if a consumer comes to Zillow.com and wants to look at a home, they might not have an agent, right? We'll suggest some agents on the right-hand side. Maybe they'll come to Zillow to get a mortgage quote. They might not have a lender. Zillow will help connect, and this sort of speaks to the second slide, Zillow will sort of help connect the consumers on the left-hand side of the, the, the slide to the right-hand side, the professionals in the space. And sort of that's where we monetize, by sort of selling ads and helping make those connections. We're a platform in some sense. So how many people in the audience are advertising on Zillow? One guy, I like Two it. hands. Okay. But yet when you look at this chart, we're all doing this stuff. Yeah, I think you're all doing this stuff. And, and Zillow is increasingly be becoming one of the primary ways consumers connect to professionals. And that's something I'll sort of address in the future. But more broadly, what all this traffic is allowing us to do is to create this enormous database, this huge home-related database where Zillow has visibility on almost every aspect of the housing process, right? How consumers are searching, what characteristics of homes are being built, what sort of 
How's the, how's the mortgage market looking? All these things, as a platform, when we connect consumers to professionals, we see all this data, and really our, our plan going forward is to sort of use this data, leverage this data, to get an even more nuanced idea of what's going on in the housing market. I, By I the way, if any of these guys sign up for advertising, I want a commission. Okay. That, we, we can work something out after the panel. Um, I think fundamentally, the reason why we do this is we think there are lots of companies that look very differently at scale. So if you think about Twitter, when Twitter first started and they had a few thousand users, right? it was really a, a personal communication platform. It was a way for me to reach out to Anthony or to Matt or to Katie. Uh, when they got big, what they did totally changed. It became about professional communication. Now if you look at Twitter, every company's on there and they're using Twitter to reach out to all their consumers. right? Or it's about how news spreads throughout the world. And that's because at scale their business looks totally different. And I think of Zillow the same way. We can do a lot of cool things and I've talked about them as a small company. But now as a big company and all this data we have access to, the set of things we can do is tremendously more interesting and much larger. So this, this gives you an idea of some of the data we generate as a platform. Um, I, I talked a little bit about sort of how many people are coming to visit the site. You know, generating reviews of real estate agent, reviews of mortgage providers. Uh, so if you see there, it says 46 million users have, have sort of updated their homes. At Zillow, if you own a home, we allow you to claim it on the internet. Lots of people do. And they then update the facts of those homes. How many bedrooms, how many bathrooms does it have? When was it last remodeled? So Zillow sort of started from a position when we were first thinking about home values of pulling in all this county data, pulling in from the county what homes were out there. Now we're in a position because of our scale where we think we actually have the best data in the country about the housing stock because we've taken the county data and we've added in all this user input on top of it. So if you want to know how many single family versus multifamily units are in a particular area, or how many one bedrooms versus two bedrooms are in a particular zip code, we think we can provide the clearest picture the clearest answers to those questions. So let me give you a, a, a sort of more general sense of the questions we're trying to ask or answer. Um, these questions I've sort of written down in green are the, are the questions when I talked earlier about just collecting data and presenting it to the consumers. This was sort of the low-hanging fruit, the idea of, of helping the consumer and anyone that wants to know figure out what a home sold for, how many square feet it had, right? When we started to lay on analysis, we were able to sort of move to more complicated questions thinking about what a home is worth, what's a home going to be worth, helping consumers think about the decision to buy versus rent. Now what we're trying to move into, the type of questions we're interested in, are the questions that previously we didn't have any data to answer, and now we do, right? What neighborhoods are getting hot? How are consumers searching over particular areas? Which two locations, you know, if, if you tend to look in a certain neighborhood in Vancouver, what other neighborhoods do you also tend to look at? These are sort of questions that we've always been interested in, we just didn't have the data to answer. And now we're getting to a place where we really think we can provide some real visibility into these really hard questions because of the unique data, data we're generating. So hopefully that gives you guys a fairly general overview of what we're doing at Zillow, both as a business and in terms of data, um, and maybe some ideas of how you guys might leverage that for the businesses you're all in. Um, if not, I guess we can talk about it more because that's what this panel's for. Thanks, guys. So by the way, you guys missed your opportunity to question any specific slide. Once these slides go by, we're not going back. <laughs> well, I'll just get started while the slides go. I'm, uh, I'm Matt. I'm the co-founder of Lost Floor. We're a lot smaller than Zillow. I'm going to stand up because I just had a cup of coffee. Do you want to walk around? Um, yeah, sorry. Sure. So, um, Walkscore's mission is to make walkability broadly defined part of how people look for a place to live. And so, we like to think of ourselves as aspiring to be the best data provider on what's outside the four walls of a property. So, things like what's nearby that I can walk to? What's public transit like near a location? How is the location for biking? What would my commute be like if I lived there? So, we're really focused on sort of what's outside the four walls of a property. Here we are in downtown Vancouver. WalkScore rates any address on a score from 0 to 100, with 100 being the most walkable, and anything above a 90, we call a walker's paradise. <laughs> so welcome to the walker's paradise that is downtown Vancouver. And one interesting thing about putting a number on something like walkability, which is inherently ambiguous and hard to define, is that it's helped establish what it means in the real estate industry. So before walk score, we would see real estate agents who would say, this home is very walkable, it's right on the golf course. 
<laughs> That's not exactly what we mean by walkability. We mean that you can accomplish your daily errands easily without a car. So part of our, what we've done with our algorithm is to help define what walkability means. Recently, we've expanded to um, other types of scores, and you can see we have kind of a transportation and getting around lens on the world. Our transit score measures how well a location is served by public transit. We import transit data from about 300 transit agencies, and then we analyze the entire transit system schedule and routes to come up with a score for that address. No surprise, we're also in a writer's paradise here in downtown Vancouver. And then uh, we recently launched a bike score, actually with the help of two professors from Vancouver, Michael Brower at UBC and Megan Winters at Simon Fraser. And bike score measures how good an area is for biking. So all of these scores use very different data, but they all work at the level of your address. So if you go to walkscore.com, you can look up these scores for your house. How many people in the, how many people in the audience are using their walk score? as a marketing angle for their products out there. Not that many. I can tell you we beat up our competitors all the time on projects. Thanks. And I guess this is a nice timing, Anthony, on the slide. Okay. I've seen the slides before. I was going to say, another way to look at WalkScore is as a way to help property owners and managers market the location of their property. So we like to think of helping really to tell the story of, um, of folks who are at ULI, which is that location is the most important thing. You can measure it in a bunch of different ways. So I love this photo of a leasing office at a big new multifamily development where the only piece of data uh, at the leasing office is the walk score. One of the things we've worked really hard at is to get our, our scores and our data and our maps onto other real estate sites because you know, it's all about our mission of making walkability part of, of people's experience as they're looking for places to live online. This is an example of our neighborhood map. We have about 30,000 real estate sites using this. I didn't know there were 30,000 real estate sites, but there actually are way more than that. And you can see it's a map of what's nearby, and you get our scores. And now, across the network of sites using WalkScore, we show about 14 million scores a day. So, you know, we have a long way to go, but we've made decent progress in terms of making this stuff something you'll encounter if you're looking for a place to live online. I thought it'd be fun, too, to talk about where WalkScore came from. The map on the left shows how far you can walk on a one-mile urban grid, and the map on the right shows a similar one-mile walk in a suburban neighborhood. These maps were uh, made by Professor Larry Frank, who's also at UBC, starting to get the impression that Vancouver has some kind of monopoly on you know, thinking around walkability and biking. And then uh, when I saw these, I just, you know, it was right around the time that everyone was doing these Google Maps mashups where people would they are basically mapping everything. So I looked at these two maps and thought, wow, we could just do these for every address. Um, we built the first prototype of WalkScore. I emailed about 20 people, and the next day we had 150,000 unique visitors on the site. So I had no idea so many people cared about this stuff. So that was kind of a pleasant surprise. Recently, we've been doing some deeper analysis with, with our data. So this is a map of how many people in Washington, D.C. can walk to fresh food in five minutes. And there's a little slider up there where you can just slide the time slider and, and pick how long you want to let people walk, and we'll tell you how many people can walk to fresh food. And what's interesting, probably most people in here have seen food desert maps or maps of food access before, but these are updated in real time as all of our underlying data sources are updated. And so you can use these to track a city's performance over time. So DC, for example, has a um, sustainability goal of having everyone within a five minute, not everyone, 75% of the people within a five minute walk of fresh food. And we can actually now track um, progress towards that goal over time. So another interesting way to kind of use these big data sets to help answer and then one of the things I really like about putting a quantifiable, num quantifiable number on anything is that it unleashes a huge amount of research. So because we put a number on walkability, people have done all kinds of studies that show that a higher walk score leads to higher home values, it leads to higher lease rates, it leads to lower mortgage default rates. And this is my favorite study that an economist named Joe Courtright did 
that show that one point of walk score is worth about two to $3,000 in the average US metro. So for the first time, as people are talking about walkability, they can quantify the financial benefit of your neighborhood getting more walkable. Matt, what's the... Uh... Oh yeah, sorry, the numbers are basically the, the uh, effect of one point of walk score on the average single family home. You'll notice Las Vegas is negative because I think people don't actually want to live on the strip. So, uh, so you, know, you can see, uh, I think Chicago is the highest one point of walk score worth about $5,000. And actually to define one of the terms used here, when people talk about big data and predictive analytics, what they're talking about is you don't, you, soon you won't have to be an economist to do this kind of study because the tools will let you, will do it for you. So right now, like these kinds of analysis are like way beyond what I could do with statistics, but we're already seeing in a bunch of software tools we use that the statistics get done by the software for you so that all these powerful predictive models can be much more democratized and more useful to people. Matt, was it you that told me the default rate for uh, homes that are in a neighborhood above walk score 75. Someone told me this crazy number. Yeah, I don't know. I actually don't know the number, but what I do know. I heard it was zero. I heard if you're in a walk score location above 75, and maybe I'm forgetting because I'm just a broker, but maybe it's 85. But the default rate on loans is zero. And how powerful is that? If you look at the suburban home prices in the 2008 crash, the prices of gas went like this and home prices went like that. And so people in walkable neighborhoods were just less susceptible to the volatility of, of gas prices. And lately what we've been spending a lot of time on is, um, is connecting property owners that have walkable properties with people who come to walkscore.com to look for walkable properties. And one of the things we're trying to do is real estate search has been very stuck on pricing bedrooms. So for, I don't know, the last decade, you look for a place online and you say, I want a two bedroom place that's you know, $2,000. And we're trying to create new ways to search. So this is the map where someone has said, I want to be able to work in downtown Vancouver and get there in 30 minutes on public transit. Where can I live? And so the area that's highlighted are all the places in Vancouver you can live where you can still make it downtown in 30 minutes on public transit. And then all those rentals on the left are sorted by transit time. So it's an example of how we're trying to take what we think of as the walkable lifestyle and build software features that help explain the benefits of walkability to people, but then also help them find a walkable place to live. So thanks, look forward to all your questions. Um, well, a little bit of context before um, diving in. So Anthony has totally nailed it. And actually, I'm now working with a brokerage too. So there is another way. <laughs> you There's can, a better way and an can, old way. <laughs> you can move um, into using technology without leaving real estate. So um, my background is in commercial real estate investment. Um, I'm from Seattle originally. Spent several years in New York. Um, as Anthony mentioned, and part of how I got to, to be on this side of the room, which is so much fun to be here right now, um, is because of, it's just, there never was quite the right information that I wanted when I was evaluating land, trying to price units, um, trying to really figure out, take the reports that we pay so many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for and usually arrive you know, by quarter, sliced up in MSA level information on a PDF that you have to call someone to get the Excel file for, although maybe that's changing a little bit. But I really struggled with that um, when I was in the, on the commercial real estate side and also working with some very small um, investment managers in the Seattle area. Like, how do we get our data so that it is relative to what's actually happening today and not last quarter? And how do we get it so we can actually use it to make a decision and not just get a sense of um, sort of what's generally happening in, in Seattle or West Vancouver or, or whatever it is. Like those numbers never helped me with anything except make sure that I didn't completely get kicked out of investment committee. So they made me make sure that I wasn't off the reservation, but they never helped me make a decision. Um, and so when I came back 
to Seattle, and that's just, it was a personal home decision for me, and looking at how do we fix these kinds of problems, I was amazed to see how much has been going on on the residential side um, and all the technology that's come there, but also, um, as you said, this is really starting to apply right back to commercial real estate. So um, when I moved um, and announced to my kind of real estate investment friends, oh, I'm joining Redfin to launch this new platform for them, a lot of the response was, but wait a minute, it's single family residential. How is that gonna be useful? Like, what is, what is going on? Um, so I guess I'll tell you that, that story, but the idea is that um, look, look at these sources, look at Walkscore, look at Zillow, look at even Trulia. Um, my PR team would probably kill me for saying that, but I actually think they're all really supportive and the data can be very useful in um, a commercial context because it's so much um, more rapid, it's so much more real time and it's so much cheaper to get. Um, so, all right, so I joined Redfin in August to launch something called Redfin Builder Services and that's the first time that, it actually isn't gonna work with this guy, but thank you. I'm just gonna sidle up to the laptop here and periodically click it. Um, so Redfin is a consumer consumer oriented real Enjoy. estate experience. Oh, I'm okay, I can just lean forward. Thank you so much. Um, so, so Redfin's mission is to reinvent real estate. So we were struggling with a lot of the same issues um, that Krishna talked about, this opacity in the marketplace. It's really hard for individuals to figure out what to buy or how to sell their house. Um, so this is all residential domain. Um, we started in 2004 by putting map, um, by putting listings on a map. Um, in 2006, we realized, you know what? It's great to be a technology company. It's great to be a mapping company. But if we want to make a real difference in the real world, we're going to have to put people in that equation. And that's pretty much because um, we are a brokerage. And so what we were trying to do at that point was like sell real estate online. And there were uh, a couple of people who were really interested in doing that. We got offers for houses that people had never toured that came in over email in 2004 and those people were all under 26 and they all worked at Microsoft. So um, when we decided we wanted to help the rest of the world, we decided we needed agents. And so Redfin is a technology company and it is a brokerage. We have, um, we're active in 25 markets in the United States. We have hundreds of agents. Um, those agents are paid on commission and on customer satisfaction. Every deal that they do is rated on the website and it is um, visible to their users or to anybody searching the website. Um, we have a 97% customer satisfaction rating. Um, we use a score called NPS or Net Promoter uh, Score to evaluate how well we're doing and that's you know, how likely would you be to recommend this experience to a friend or a family member. Um, and as context, Apple, which was one of the most beloved companies um, in the world, their NPS is about 71. And Redfin's NPS is 81. So to know Redfin is to love Redfin. And so we think we're doing a really good job helping there. I'll walk you through very briefly what the consumer experience is for those of you who haven't um, seen it before. So people, same as Zillow, map-based search. Um, the difference is that because we're a brokerage, uh, listings that are through our brokerage, our listing agents are representing with us, um, will show up sort of at the top of the list there. They tend to get anywhere between um, two to seven times as much visibility as other listings on our search. Um, and then the other difference between this is that instead of um, another agent, because Red, Redfin does not advertise, it's our agents that show up and they'll show up um, by the area that they cover. Um, it's, we try to make it extremely easy for people to access agents so that they can click to tour, click to call, so it's really easy and we're trying to take that whole concept of you know, how do you find the house, how do you find the agent and make everything um, as quick as sort of we want it in this, in this day and age. So what does that mean for developers um, and why are we talking about Redfin Builder Services? So our vision um, at Redfin is to reinvent real estate for consumers. My role is to, I'm launching this group called Redfin Builder Services, working specifically with real estate developers and our urban home builders. So we're taking a combination of our data, our engaged buying population, because we've got millions of buyers online who are looking for homes and looking for new inventory, especially um, in the recent constrained market that we've had. 
and then our team of agents, of designers, of PR and media people and email specialists. And so the biggest problem that we're tackling right now is sales and marketing. So you can think of my team as an outsourced sales and marketing team that happens to have some really, really badass technology um, and some amazing people. There are other problems that we want to get into. We get asked re regularly to help people not just price their buildings and bring them to market, but earlier in the process with, okay, look, I'm building an XYZ neighborhood. Should I do one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms? What's the lift I'm going to get on this uh, per unit if I add a garage or not? So we can do that kind of evaluation, and we're slicing not just the data around deals that have sold, but deals that are in our brokerage that we can tell how many early indicators, how many times those homes are getting toured, how many times those homes are getting viewed and clicked and favorited by other people. So we're seeing indications of demand well in advance of an actual transaction. Of course, the holy grail is how do you find an underwrite land? Um, that's the part that I personally struggled with the most as an investor. Um, so that is that we will eventually move in that direction. That's my dream and my vision. Um, that's the thing that used to keep me up at night. Uh, but we're starting where we're the strongest, which is in sales and marketing. We have, and how do we do that? I, will, I won't go into all the details, but we, we use technology not as a way to displace a relationship or, or cut out a human relationship. We had a big conversation about this topic at the Emerging uh, Leaders Breakfast yesterday, sort of people saying, oh no, well, is this move to online? Does that mean that we're not gonna need brokers anymore? And I, I said, no way, it just means it's less of a pain in the ass to get a hold of your broker. You don't have to talk about as much dumb stuff like reading off the same information you've already told them four times to, to get to the really heart of it. So I actually view a lot about tech, the way that Redfin is using technology and the way that hopefully all of your technologies are being used is a way to create a, re a stronger relationship faster, to slice through the crap that nobody likes to spend time doing and, and get to the good stuff. And the way that we use our website is, is as a giant listening device. Um, we watch and we learn and we listen to every click that our customers are doing, whether they're registered with us or not, and we're, we're understanding their patterns. So this is just one of the many examples there are for people who are searching, and, and this is a Seattle zip code because we're not in Canada yet, um, but that is on the horizon. So in this case, um, these folks are looking here in this target zip code of 98105, and then we're saying, okay, the people who look in this zip code are 52% likely to also be looking in the adjacent community or the adjacent zip code to the north. The next most likely is that sort of, that's for you Seattleites, Green Lake, sort of Finney Ridge, and then a little bit over to the west. They are definitely not looking in the south. So when we think about targeting messages, and we know actually we can track this down to the email, we know how to target the messages. So if one in neighborhood you're gonna get more value, or if one in neighborhood you're gonna get more, you know, you're gonna pay more, but it's gonna be a vibrant cultural scene, we can tailor the messages so that we're giving the right message to the right buyer at the right time. Um, we also work with, directly with developers. So um, just this is a, a pilot project that we've done. It's with a Vancouver developer here who I'm meeting with immediately after this panel. Um, for Canadians, it's in-house development. They have a beautiful boutique project in Ballard, which is one of the coolest neighborhoods in Seattle. Um, and they are working with us. Our first meeting, they said, oh, look, you know, we already know that everyone buying our condos is going to be looking for them on redfin.com. Why should we list with you? So we went through that process about, you know, we've got the best data, we've got the best engagement with the buyers, and we've got this amazing, essentially, media company. And when I say media company, I mean data, but also design, also email targeting, also PR, um, so that we can elevate the brand and the, and the message about the building uh, much further. So we designed them a whole new website, which was beautiful and crisp and unlike a lot of other websites. Uh, the Gehrig and Lyman Group worked on, on this with us, and we just won a fantastic um, international award for this design. Um, we also created print collateral for them that had the same messaging, and you can see this is a very contemporary look, and this works for us because this is who is on redfin.com. This is what people on redfin.com want to buy. And it's not just the millennials, um, it's also a lot of move down buyers. So we're, we're tracking those trends. We're trying to answer these questions beyond the numbers of square feet and the numbers of sort of dollars per month that you're gonna pay. 
And we actually did a lot of linking back to walk score to help people understand what the neighborhood was like and the characteristics of it. Um, we did something that we've never done before with this project and we will continue to do with our, um, with our real estate developer and home builder clients. We took over the homepage of redfin.com for four days during the launch week um, and that was unbelievable. This homepage cannot be bought. Um, so we did that and we created direct link backs to the listings on the MLS which provided unbelievable transparency to the real estate developer about how much traffic and how it was coming to them. So this was a great fun experiment. Um, it caused a lot of uproar uh, on the engineering teams but they got over it and are really excited to do it again. So these are just some examples. We have a lot of precision email campaigns. So it's basically we're taking this data and we're taking it one step beyond that insight level to the decision level. So like how am I going, who am I going to target? What am I going to say to them? How much can I price it for who they are? Um, and what am I gonna do when they come in the sales center? So we're integrating all the way through the end to end. So not just online, these are our agents, this is our project, there's a 3D model that you can touch and feel. There's our developer, Dave, in the lower right hand corner. Um, so we're coming, off the screen and taking this into real life. Um, and that is very difficult right now, but it is an incredible source of insight because we are seeing online and we're also seeing the real world. So we are still continuing to learn. I would love to talk to you about what kinds of data that you're looking for, what kinds of help you would like, um, where you're struggling to bridge what's going on online with what's going on in the real world, um, because it's a really wonderful experiment. I feel really lucky to be working on it. Is this a co-branded beer up there in the corner? What we did, actually, yes. So this is actually a perfect walk score moment. Um, we were in Ballard, which is kind of a hipster neighborhood in Seattle, and we wanted to give a treat to, um, for the broker's open house and the people who were part of the priority reservation list for this building who'd been really excited, but we weren't allowed to market it until it was on the MLS. So we had this fabulous party, and we went to the Urban Family Public House, which is about a five-minute walk down um, the road and we got these branded uh, beer, uh, beer uh, growlers and we, we uh, worked it out so that on the back of that tag is actually a walking map that shows the people how to get there so that we didn't just have to tell them, oh, this is a 24-7 community, oh, it has great hip and knife, nightlife and great food and whatever. We didn't have to tell them that at all and we didn't even have to just show it to them. We just gave them the growler and they walked down the street and they traded them in, about 250 people got a free fill of beer. I just got the bill for it yesterday. Um, <laughs> and it was great because it, it just showed them and get the, got them in the skin of what their life would be like if they lived there. So we're constantly trying to do that. We actually have a lot of relationships with food people um, because we're trying to get, again, like between that idea of data and merging it with what's happening in the real world. See, those are the marketing ideas that an old school broker like me. Yes. I relate to when we when we look to lease office space. Yeah, the alcohol. I think a lot of people related to. So that was fun. It was really fun. Kate, that was fantastic on unbelievable short notice. So let's give her a round. Yeah, so you, you found out about this yesterday night, and then we couldn't get your slides up. That's like an anxiety dream. Like, no, the, I didn't do the, the slides meeting. until you were getting me my coffee this afternoon. So don't. It was fine. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> On the fly. So, questions? I have a question for Matt. I'm Kenny Asher. I'm the Community Development Director for a small city just outside of Portland, Oregon, uh, Tigard. It's a suburban city which has just fully committed itself to walkability as the city's vision and strategic uh, approach, uh, which is great and astonishing since it's very suburban. Immediately the question comes up, how are we going to measure our success here? And so. I guess good news for you, everybody goes right to walk score. But my question is about the evolution of your methodology. Uh -huh. Because when you have, when you take a really, really careful look at how granular that information is about how walkable a specific location is and not just how proximate destinations are, it begins to call into question just how useful it will be for a city that really wants to do it right and be able to measure its progress. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how that's evolving in your company? Yeah, I'd love, that's a great question. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, I, I love Portland. Um, so um, 
Yeah, you know, when WalkScore, over the last, I would say, five years, we've done a lot of work to align the WalkScore algorithm with all of the academic research around walkability. And I didn't realize how many academic researchers there are <laughs> studying walkability, but it's, it's pretty walk. amazing. And, I, and the reason is because it's so tied to, you know, home value and quality of life and, you know, public health. You know, we've seen amazing studies on how the built environment affects public health where they're using walk score data. So the, the latest, I'll kind of, I'll skip to the latest version of the, the algorithm. Um, so first, it's very hard to get a, a perfect data set of every nearby point of interest. And so we probably aggregate at this point, you know, 10, 10 or more different data providers to get all the schools and parks and grocery stores. And those things are in constant flux. Things are opening and closing. And so on top of a bunch of sort of um, algorithmic stuff we do, we have added a layer of crowdsourcing because nobody knows your neighborhood better than you do. So if you come to our site and you see that something is wrong, mm. you can just log in and fix it. Uh, then in terms of the algorithm itself, um, the latest version of WalkScore uses a lot of data from OpenStreetMap, mm. which is to maps what Wikipedia is to the encyclopedia. Um, Wikipedia is really hard to understand. And my best, my favorite quote about Wikipedia is that it doesn't work in theory, it only works in practice. <laughs> so you can't try to understand like why Wikipedia works, it just does. And the same is true for OpenStreetMap. It is a crowdsourced map of the world. And it's amazing, and it's free. And so we can download every road, every path, every park um, in the world on OpenStreetMap. And so now when we compute a walk score for a location, we're looking at hundreds and hundreds of walking routes that include all these paths and things. We're doing an algorithmic analysis of the underlying road network to look at things like how long is the average block, uh, how, how high is the intersection density, and a few other planning metrics like that. And most importantly, there is no perfect data set. So, you know, if, if we're missing the path in OpenStreetMap, someone can go into OpenStreetMap and fix it, and then we'll pick up that, pick up that change. So, um, you know, uh, what is the saying? Like, perfect is often the enemy of good. And, you know, we're not, uh, you know, we're definitely not perfect, but we try to be transparent about what we do and give mm -hmm. people ways to fix it. And in a way, we look up to our, um, uh, I don't know if I was going to say Zillow is like our big brother or like a 10,000 pound gorilla, but you know, Zillow, um, Zillow's growth, I think Krishna was very modest when he showed that slide about the growth to 70 million unique monthly visitors, but that is astounding. There are very few websites that ever reach the kind of scale that Zillow has reached. And this estimate is, no one, no one at Zillow would say this estimate is a perfect technology, it's a useful technology. So we kind of look to, to Zillow and what, what they've done with that data. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Yeah, question. Are any of your companies working with the large publicly traded home builders? Mm -hmm. If so, can you tell us about it? So to restate the question, mm -hmm. are any of the uh, panelists working with the large publicly traded home builders? And if so, please share. Sure, you guys? Do you want to? Um, so we have engaged with some of them. Um, that was our original thought about, hey, we could help so quickly with that. Um, one of the things, we're, we're, I'm still in product development mode. Um, I started launching this platform in August and I've had the, of, of 2013, and I've had the support of an amazing team and a lot of people were working on it before I arrived at Redfin, but um, we're still trying to figure out how to make that relationship work because the way that Redfin makes money is by listing the home. And a lot of the Lennars and DR Hortons and Pultis of the world um, have their internal sales staff that they have um, on their balance sheet and on their payroll. So it might work maybe in a downturn if there was a home builder of that size that wanted to vary, make some of their costs variable or make reduce the cash flow and take it as a sort of pay at close with an external agent. But they have such strong relationships with their team and the, the production is so integrated uh, that it would be hard to do that. We're also looking at a very light digital offering. We're trying to find ways to make our analytics um, and our, our buyer base visible and accessible to those home builders, but we haven't quite figured out what that product is gonna be yet, so if you have ideas, let me know. Uh, someone's at the mic first. Uh, uh, Krishna, I was wondering if on Zillow, 
I'm sure you have the data, but I was wondering if you had access to basically suggestive regression analysis if you added this to your house, mm -hmm. if you added another bathroom, if you added a swimming yeah, pool, we, whatever it be, this is how you could create the biggest net uh, increase mm -hmm. in value. Yeah, so we've definitely been very recently looking in those sort of issues, um, trying, to, trying to give people a sense of what the return on investment might be for various improvements or things like that. Um, I don't think we've, we've finished the analysis yet. It's sort of a complicated issue in some sense, just because it's so heterogeneous, right? One person puts in a bathroom at super high end, one person puts in at super low end, and it's really hard to get visibility into often that. So it does require a lot of sort of statistical playing around to try to tease out what's really going on. Um, but yeah, we're definitely looking at an issue. I don't think we have anything available currently, but if you sort of in the near future, I would definitely expect to see Appreciate a lot of analysis of those sort of issues. Very good. Thanks. We had two questions in the front right here. Uh, for Matt, uh, two questions. One, do you have any competition in the marketplace? And two, the commercial real estate industry can sometimes be loath to accept new technologies. How have you been approached by commercial real estate and who, what does it look like and how they react and who might you be partnering with? Just kind of give us a landscape. So to clarify commercial real estate, are you talking about office product or are you talking about all the folks who are institutional? <laughs> all product types, <laughs> commercial, institutional, gorillas that have just moved too slow. How have any of them come to you to partner? Yeah. Good, good question, thanks. Um, in terms of competition, we have a couple small direct competitors, but I think in a way our biggest competitor is, is Google and everything they're doing to really show you. I mean, the pace of innovation on Google Maps is amazing. And when we started, you couldn't even see the nearby points of interest on Google Maps. And now, you know, when you search for an address, you see everything that's nearby. You see all the amazing street views. You see all the user submitted photos they bought. You know, um, Zagat, so they have all the reviews. I mean, it's sort of like, I mean, they're, you know, I guess anyone in software is worried they're going to get crushed <laughs> by Google. Uh, but we, we've had a great partnership with them so far, but they are. Uh, they're even bigger than Zillow, you can imagine. <laughs> I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in terms of the commercial stuff, um, you know, we, we have a lot of technology around calculating uh, commute times really rapidly, and so we had bounced around some ideas like, well, gosh, you could tell us all of your employees' home locations, and then we would rate the average commute time and actually calculate the total commute time for every single employee, and then we thought, yeah, but the boss just picks the location anyway, so why bother? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we've seen, um, we haven't seen as much adoption in the commercial real estate space, and I'd, I'd love to hear theories about why I don't totally Actually, I, I can speak to that. Oh, these, yeah. these guys are a lot smarter than us, but I know about that space. Oh, yeah. I there's a, yeah, okay. So um, in the U.S., there's a company called LoopNet, yeah. Yeah. and it shows commercial real estate listings, et cetera. It was just Purchased by, by CoStar. CoStar for yeah. $800 million. CoStar is basically a data company. Yeah. But in Canada, there was a company called Space Release, hmm. right. and it was sold to Altus Insight, big giant thing that tried to merge the databases, and it kind of screwed it up. And then a little guy, like a little skateboard dude from Vancouver, has entered the space and he is doing great. And oh, we've cool. gone behind him and you guys should check it out. It's called Space List. Oh, cool. Space List, check it out. Yeah, you know, and, it's uh, interesting because the, um, you know, we, uh, we have an apartment search site on walkscore.com and this whole space has really heated up. I mean, CoStar also just bought apartments.com yeah. for something like $600 million. And um, it's interesting, you know, they're the same, um, cycles and software as there are in the economy. And a few years ago, the apartment search space on the web was kind of, was kind of dead. You know, Zillow bought Hotpads, which was a pretty big apartment site, and they picked it up for, I think it was like 15 million bucks or something. Right. People looked at that and said, oh, apartment business isn't that interesting. <laughs> and then apartments.com you know, just sold for a huge amount of money, and we're seeing a lot of money go into apartment search sites um, like, like, like Walkscore, and it's interesting Lovely. to see CoStar basically rolling up. Lovely just got acquired by RentPath, which is another roll-up play. So CoStar is rolling up a bunch of apartment search sites. RentPath is rolling up a bunch of apartment search sites. It's just interesting to see the uh, consolidation and see that space heating up right now. So Matt, how does Walkscore make money? Uh, we make money in two ways. One is uh, licensing our, our data. So you know, Zillow is a customer of ours, for example. Yeah. They license our, our data. They have Walkscore and Transit Score on every listing. And you know, Zillow has been really visionary. They were one of the first large sites to adopt Walkscore. And since I'm a very mission, I happen to be a really mission-driven person, and the fact that there is a transit score on every Zillow listing 
in, in, in the United States in a country where public transit often has negative perceptions, but, in, but is growing in importance among millennials and people who sort of want transportation options. I just think it's, it was really visionary of them to have that. And for me, it felt really good from a mission perspective that people looking at a Zillow listing are thinking about public transit and realizing that um, you know, that kind of transportation choice and transportation freedom is, is, uh, is really what people want. And you see that in the, in the 2008 downturn, for example, some of the only homes that appreciated in the entire country were homes near light rail. And so it was interesting to see those, those studies. Um, so, yeah. We had one question in the front. Anthony. Zillow makes money by selling advertising to the eyeballs on the website. Yeah, it's, it's, so she showed you a picture of what Redfin looks like. Zillow, the interface search for home looks very similar, but on the right-hand side, we sell ads to individual agents. We also have a, a large mortgage marketplace, which is if consumers are looking for a lender, Zillow will help them connect to lenders, and lenders pay to be sort of listed on the platform. Um, so we have a number of uh, business lines like that. But Go for it, Bobby. My question is about how you measure cube versus square foot. I think as an owner, a developer, a tenant, uh, I'm interested. I think that's where we're going. So it's, this question is for all three of you. How do you measure cube versus square foot? And if you're not, uh, yeah. and if you're not doing it, you need to be thinking about it. That's where the market's going. Great. Yeah. Totally. Great suggestion. That yeah. was, oh, go Are ahead. you doing go it? Ahead. No, I think we're trying. It's difficult. Um, yeah. Um, but in, in general, in, in all these spaces, the I think one of the reasons why the real estate space is so difficult is because so many things that are important are really hard to get the right number on, right? And Walkstar is a great example of seeing this thing that everyone cared about, and they did a great job of putting a number on it. Mm -hmm. And that's something at, at Zillow on the data side, we struggle all the time. This also relates, there was a question earlier about improvements, right? How can we try to put a number on the quality of an improvement? So we under, these sort of things, I think, we're getting better at, and that's going to be a lot of the future. That as we get better at putting numbers on things that previously we knew were important, but we couldn't really study. Because yeah. there was no real make real comparisons, we're getting better and better at that. And that's sort of a lot of things what big data is about, generating this extra data and allowing us to analyze it in new ways and put numbers on things that previously we could just wave our hands and talk about. Mm -hmm. At yeah. the mic. Is there a point when you have uh, too much data? I guess one of the criticisms of big data is that you know you can have enough data and you can correlate anything with anything, but it's not necessarily meaningful, and you can't really prove causation. So is there a point when you just have too many variables and you want to concentrate more on the quality rather than the quantity of data? Mm -hmm. Well, let me share. You know, I, I think one thing that's really helpful when people ask me what is big data, the big data part of it is pretty easy to understand because it's just a lot of data. Um, the, the predictive analytics part of big data, which is where a lot of the innovation is, is harder to understand. And one of the best ways to understand it is, um, so we use Google Analytics on our, on our Walk Score website to measure what all of our traffic is doing. And Google Analytics has recently made it very easy to do these things called A-B tests, where you segment your traffic and you show each segment a different version of your website, and they do all of the t statistics to tell you which version won. So at any given time now on our site, we're running 10 different mm -hmm. versions of the website, and Google Analytics is automatically serving different versions of our site to all these different people, and most importantly, they're calculating all the statistics about which experiments win. And you can imagine how, how complex that matrix is if you have 10 different versions of your site running. So that's a good example of the power of predictive analytics when it's built into a software tool where I don't know how it works, I just use it. And, and in the same way, um, you know, I think that, uh, that the too much data problem is often that it's too hard to know what's meaningful and what's not meaningful, and that's um, why you see all these companies hiring economists. And what I'm excited for, my goal is for WalkScore to be big enough to hire a chief economist someday. Um, but, but until then, hopefully someone will build more software tools that build the predictive analytics into the software so that you don't need a statistician on your team to make sense of what's meaningful versus uh, what's not meaningful. We had a question in the front row. Anthony, I'd love to answer that briefly, too. Yeah. Um, so there's, a, I think it's a really good question, but the way that we solve that a lot of the time at Redfin is by coming back to the customer and trying to use, like, is this helpful to a human 
who's trying to do something, what exactly are they trying to do, what exactly is the pain point, um, and how do we create something, you know, what's our hypothesis about how we're going to make that better and then we can test for it. And when we have a very clear thought process about what we're trying to accomplish and who we're trying to help, then it's easy, it's easier to see if we're getting it or not. Um, loose thinking begets loose data, begets impossible sort of answers or indecipherable answers. So that's the way that we focus it. And a lot of the time, um, I find myself in a position where I am actually having the opposite problem all the time. I always want more data. And I come from the real estate development perspective. I have a planning background and an economics background and always am wanting to pull more things into it. Um, but it's not always, um, it's not always helpful beyond an academic perspective. And the goal also is to use the complexity of the data yeah. to create a really simple customer yes. experience. Because every, I'm yeah. sure everyone here knows that, um, yeah. you know, I think Zillow was one of the first big sites that announced more than 50% of their traffic was mobile. Yes. And um, apps are winning on mobile and apps over the mobile web. And apps tend to be kind of single purpose apps. I love Uber, for example, just yes. because they've just nailed the scenario of getting a cab. I mean, the experience is so incredible and luxurious, but it only does one thing. And so there's this simplicity that people are coming to expect from apps, and, and in order to deliver um, you know, that Apple-like simplicity, it takes a huge amount of mm -hmm. data to understand which things you can cut out of the experience and which things you need to promote in the experience. So it's interesting to see sophisticated companies using this mess of data to basically simplify their customer experience. Question in the front. You had mentioned um, food deserts. Yeah. And in areas like uh, urban areas where there may be um, food deserts, there's probably also uh, deserts of other types. Housing yeah. stock is down. But mm -hmm. if they're adjacent to burgeoning areas like a downtown area, uh, what are you seeing in mm -hmm. In these set in, in trends, data trends with regard to uh, information that can help builders to identify mm. spot development in those very closely adjacent neighborhoods. Hmm, that's interesting. So while they're thinking about it, question was related to food deserts. There are deserts of other issues, whether it's housing stock or whatnot. So what are they doing to apply their tools? to study what the opportunities are in the immediate adjacencies. Well, Did I, I get that right? I don't, I don't know. It's a great question. I don't have a great answer for it. But I know that um, one of the ways analysts who are looking to pick development sites are using walk score data is mm -hmm. you know, we take, um, I don't know, maybe 50 kind of data points that we create to make one walk score. And so one of the things we've done is we will give developers access to all the underlying components that make up our score. And um, you know, so I was actually talking with uh, Wendy Waters, who's right over here, about this very thing over lunch. And so she found, for example, that um, one of the things that drives good performance in, in the buildings that her company owns was um, short block length and high intersection density, which is one of the components that goes into our score. And so I think what we're seeing is people doing these statistical analyses where they take all the components and they might not even have a theory about what drives the value, but it can become clear through statistics. So it's not a great answer, but I thought I'd give it a shot. Thank you. In a second, how do you, you two, how do you all, what's, what's the meaning behind Red Fan and Zillow? How do you all come into the, the names. Uh, yeah, the names. Uh, so Zillow, actually, it, it's a combination of zillions and pillows. Uh, the idea was to try to think about when you're buying a home, some of it's soft, it's emotional, that's the pill only aspect, but we're a data company, that's the zillions and zillions of data points. So they sort of smushed it together and went with it. Oh, I didn't think of it. I'm sure they thought about it for a while. Um, I'd, I'd love to be able to claim it because I think it's a great name. Also um, an easy stock ticker. Yeah, the, the Z is a nice stock ticker, it's true. Yeah. Um, Any comment on... Uh, I have been so busy focusing on my business line. I will get back to you on that one. I actually don't know. I actually know the story. Okay, yeah, shoot, great. Red Make up a funny is, uh, story. Uh, <laughs> well, there was this one day when Glenn was walking <laughs> down the street. Might be great to answer this, but uh, Redfin, I think, is, is a word scramble, a finder and friend. Oh, and that's, that's just one of the good. historical things there. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, question at the mics. Uh, just wondering about uh, plans for the Canadian market for Redfin and Zillow. 
So I didn't quite hear that. Canadian market for Redfin and Zillow? We're working on it. Yeah, we, we aren't. We're a domestically focused company uh, in terms of the U.S. Um, I think, I'm, again, this is, I can't speak to, to what sort of goes on in the secret councils at Zillow, but I think we're focused on the, the U.S. market for now. We actually turned our app on um, for access up here specifically because of our Vancouver clients. Um, and it's still on because I checked some things from it yesterday. So. <laughs> but we'll try to get up here soon. So we have another question at the mic, and then I have a question for the panel. Um, I have uh, three questions. With Zillow, at what point um, did people start taking ownership of their properties and updating them themselves? And what percentage of the users are doing that? And then um, also, how many analysts are at your companies for WalkScore and Zillow? Sure. Um, Zero. <laughs> Let me Which rephrase the last question <laughs> differently, but why don't you tackle the first two questions? Okay. Uh, so the first question is about what fraction people claim. So when you, you can claim your home at any point after you own it, and we, so the, the way where we verify your ownership is we ask you some details about that show up from when that sort of from form the, is processed by the county. So almost county. a month or two after you've bought a home, you can claim it on Zillow, and then you can choose if a lot of people like to update their home facts because, you know, they, they sort of, in some sense, want everyone to know how many actual bedrooms, how many bathrooms they have if they choose to, su to sell it again later. Uh, right now, we're at a point where I think the, the housing stock of the U.S. is roughly 110 million homes, uh, of which 45 million of them have been claimed. So a large fraction of them have been claimed. Um, it's not a large percentage of our overall traffic, because a lot of our traffic people are searching for homes, mm -hmm. searching for rentals. They don't own one yet. Uh, so I'd have to think a little bit more about what percentage of the traffic claim home, but a large fraction of homes in the U.S. have been claimed on Zillow. Uh, on the how far did, when did that happen? How far into the company did, did that... Uh, oh, you're saying when did we roll out the feature? Right. How, when did people start using that feature? Oh, I, it's been rolled out for quite a while. Um, uh -huh. I, I don't know the exact date, but I think almost immediately it got a lot of engagement. I think people... You know, it's, it's kind of fun. It, it, when you claim your home, we'll also we'll send you periodic emails about how the value of your home is changing. People love that. I mean, I certainly just bought a home. I, want, I go to Zillow daily just to see if it went up or down. You know, like, I, I could look at the actual code, but I'm like, let me look at the website. It's a little bit better experience than at my little terminal. Uh, so let me uh, rephrase her last question. And I know there's some owners in the audience who own office space. Technology is a super hot industry for many of the markets around the country for office users. All three of you are technology firms with office space. So how many employees do you have? How many offices do you have? And what do you think the growth is going to be? Speed round. OK. Uh, OK, how many employees do we have? We just crossed the 1,000 employee mark. Um, the main offices for the headquarters of Zillow is Seattle. We also have an, an office in Nebraska, an office in New York, an office in San Francisco, an office in Irvine, um, a sort of a mix of people throughout the company. On the analytical side, we have a team of, of roughly 45 people who sort of think about data and questions around like predictive modeling, the things we've talked about, um, all of whom have sort of various backgrounds, statistics, math, economics, things like that. Was that all the speed around questions? Perfect. Great. Chris Leinberger was in Seattle, and he was at the Zillow headquarters, which is you know class A, like sky rise. <laughs> we, have, we have nice skyscraper views. Skyscraper office with views over the water. And then he came to our office, and he said, Matt, you wouldn't, I like, he said, I can't believe the difference between the Zillow office and this office. You guys are in an old industrial auto parts building, and Zillow's got this class A space. So we're, uh, we're 10 people. We're in the Capitol Hill neighborhood in Seattle. I love our office, actually. Yeah, you got street it, cred. Is, it is in an old auto parts building, and it's like the classic uh, startup industrial loft. And I think we're eight engineers and a couple of business people, and probably seven of us bike to work every day, and the other people take the bus. So it's a very like, classic kind of millennial office setup. Matt, how many people do you think you'll be two, three years from now? I don't know. I guess it depends on. Uh, first, you got to hire the chief economist. Yeah, first, you got to hire the chief economist. Because <laughs> we, we can't model that. We don't yeah. have the statistical ability <laughs> on our staff. So. Do any kind of predictions. That's what I'm <laughs> Got it. Kate, Redfin. <laughs> so we're in 25 markets. Our headquarters is in Seattle. Um, we've got offices in San Francisco, Boston, um, DC, Virginia, Chicago, um, all the usual places in Texas. Um, our headquarters in Seattle, we actually don't break out our numbers by cities. Um, so, but we are in two and a half floors and um, rapidly expanding. So. 900 brokers, give or take. Mm -hmm. There was a question right here. Yeah, 
Last question, by the way. For Krishna, in non-disclosure states, how do you obtain your Z estimates? Yeah, it's tough. So just, just for sort of clarification, the biggest input into the estimate process is looking at the past sales amount, which we don't always have access to. In some states, that isn't part of the public record. Uh, generally, we'll leverage all the data we can. So we'll look, so for example, mortgage filings. We'll look at listing amounts, sort of ev pulling from every source possible. Those states, it tends to be a lot harder, and those are places where the estimate is sort of less accurate overall. Um, can I sneak in a question, too, about do we have time? I, I actually really wanted to hear, I don't know, I, it sort of feels like, in some sense, the transportation space is being disrupted mm -hmm. with, you know, like, now Uber, we talked about yeah. Lyft, things like that. I mean, if a Google self-driving car is down the road, what's that going to do to how we, yeah. and, and certainly, personally, when I think about walkability, it's really important to me, mostly because I hate parking. I hate the idea of having to drive somewhere in the city and park there, and if that paradigm changes, how do you yeah. think, what do you think is going to happen to walkability in these neighborhoods? Yeah, and walkability is what urban planners, as you all know, use as a shorthand for a whole range of, of things, and that's what we mean by a, a, a walk score. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's interesting, because Seattle right now, uh, we are voting on a big cut to our public transit system. So Seattle, mm -hmm. the economy's booming, there are developments going up everywhere, Amazon's almost at 100,000 people, uh, and we're about to make a major, well, I hope we don't, but you know, people are voting on whether or not to make a major cut to our transportation system. That's like the depressing part of it. On the other hand, um, we've got car to go which is an incredible you know, point to point uh, car service. So like I broke my chain on my bike the other day, took it to the bike shop, took a car to go to work. It was amazing. Uh, we've got Uber, we've got Lyft. We also just capped the number of UberX drivers in Seattle. So all the regulatory stuff around this is, is very interesting. But I think you know, if you want a, a world class city mm -hmm. has to have world class transportation options. And I'm very excited about all the innovation in peer-to-peer -peer car sharing and car-to-go and Uber and Lyft. And really, my favorite technology in this entire space is the bicycle. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not kidding, because for people to feel safe riding, you have to do some of the things that Vancouver has done. You have to have protected cycle lanes in downtown, or else no one will ever ride. I have a very dangerous... 30 minute ride to work every day across Seattle. You have to be a little crazy to want to do that in Seattle's dark winters. Um, so I'm really excited about um, cities realizing that people want transportation choices and biking is very aspirational. Not that many people actually bike, but lots of people want to and, and have very warm associations with it. So I think you can have world-class transportation it's easier to have that world-class transportation now that there's such a broader mix of transportation options, and I'm just excited for more of them. I think it's great to end on that note where we're looking into the future, and then we go back to one of the oldest technologies, the bicycle. <laughs> Everyone's been great. Let's have a great round of applause for the panel. <laughs>